All right, hello folks. Uh, this is two videos in two days. That's um, much better work ethic than I anticipated actually for this channel, but you know, we'll see how, how long that lasts, I suppose. Uh, Bobby here, Mahalo Drive Through is the channel. Thank you for watching once again. Um, this video, I am going to be reviewing an album. I'm going to be reviewing Lowe's new album called Double Negative. I picked this one up um, a week or two ago, sort of slightly after it was released. It came out on the 14th of September. Uh, and uh, I've been really enjoying it uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, what's going on on this record and I will attempt to um, convince you about uh, why it is so excellent. Uh, I've been listening to Low for quite a number of years. They're, they're a trio from Minnesota if you haven't heard of them. Um, they've existed and have been releasing lots of albums since about 1994 I believe. Uh, Double Negative, this record is their 12th studio album. Uh, they began their career playing uh, very sort of minimalist, slow, um, sort of trio guitar based music uh, that was often referred to as slowcore. Um, I believe they hate that label. They, I think they must think it's too reductive or something. Um, and I don't blame them really because since their first sort of decade or so worth of music, um, they have evolved um, as time has passed. Their music has become wider in scope. Um, their approach has changed as well. The production values sort of seem to change a little bit from album to album now. Uh, and so you're never quite um, confident that you know what you're going to get with a new low release these days. Um, I mean, the mood has possibly stayed, the mood of their music has possibly stayed fairly consistent, but in terms of actual ingredients and what, what is creating this mood, um, that tends to change a little bit more recently. Um, I guess the most distinguishing and constant thing or ingredient about their music is the vocal harmonies. Alan Sparhawk, the guitar player, and Mimi Parker, the drummer, both sing in the band, um, and their harmonies, their vocal harmonies, um, sound like nothing else in, in all of um, pop music, I reckon. Um, they're sort of breathtakingly beautiful, but they're also very melancholic, um, sort of in equal measure. Um, they're sort of jaw-droppingly gorgeous, these harmonies, and so um, whenever they sing together, it's, it's quite special. Um, and that fortunately happens on double negative uh, quite a bit, as we'll see. So uh, it is my first album review on this channel. I'm going to see how, uh, how this goes. Uh, I don't want to be too long-winded about it, but I want to go um, track by track very quickly, hopefully, um, and end up at some kind of uh, verdict. So uh, look, it's, um, it's a great album cover, a very sort of simple album cover, sort of a ghostly type um, uh, shape, maybe. Um, is that meant to be one of those sort of um, adapter things that you put like a, um, a an SD card in or something? It, it looks something like that, but I'm not sure what the hell it is, but it looks very ghostly. I love the title, Double Negative, as well, um, without wanting to sort of be too nerdy here. Double Negative is it seems to have two meanings. You can either say something is so negative, it's doubly negative. Or of course, if you want to get mathematical, a double negative does make a positive. Um, so the, the double meaning of the title um, itself is a bit of a um, clue maybe about what the band is trying to do here. It's a very moody listen. Um, but uh, like a lot of melancholic music, um, you sometimes end up feeling a little bit euphoric as a result of um, the doom and gloom somehow. I don't know how that works um, <laughs> chemically in the brain, but something seems to happen along those lines with a lot of these sort of moody um, albums, for me at least, and I'm sure that's the case for a lot of other people as well. 
Um, the album starts with a song called Quorum, and um, it's sort of immediately uh, apparent that it's going to be a, a slightly difficult listen. Um, it's a very sort of rhythmic, static or white noise for, for you know, quite a while that um, sort of brings the track in. Um, some harmonic information creeps in very slowly, um, followed by very altered um, voices. Um, when I say altered, I mean there's a vocoder sort of effect. Um, there's definitely compression going on, which kind of makes it cut in and out of the mix very abruptly. Um, so very, um, I sort of guess, ghostly voices coming in and out. Um, at around the 155, two minute mark, um, the voices be begin to sound a little bit more human um, and the white noise briefly stops um, and re-enters again pretty quickly afterwards. So there's a, there's a bit of mercy from, from all the noise and then it, um, it shoots right back at you. Uh, it's intentionally jarring. It's meant to be jarring. Um, and it's a signal that this sort of beloved slowcore band, as I mentioned before, um, who recorded, you know, slowcore classics like Things We Lost in the Fire um, almost two decades ago now. It's a signal that they've changed. Um, they're no longer um, predominantly um, soft guitar strumming and, you know, brushes on the drums. Um, that's not really going on in this album anymore. Um, so, you know, I think the first track is a deliberate signal that, that Low has shifted gears and they're doing something quite different now. Um, and that leads not neatly into the second track called Dancing and Blood, um, which again starts with a sort of distorted, regular sort of thudding noise and you can softly hear, a, you can hear a soft metronome alongside this as well. Um, and Mimi Parker's vocals sort of emerge as if from, you know, the other side of this dark abyss, um, sort of very haunting, but very sort of distant. Um, the track subtly builds in intensity over the opening few minutes, I guess. Um, a melodic guitar layer is kind of added following um, and followed by like a synth, um, sort of high pitched synth squeaks. Um, and distant sounding vocal harmonies again. So again, like this is the first two tracks of the album. They're, they're not easing you into this listen. They're, they're sort of challenging you um, in the first couple of songs to sort of go with them on this ride. Um, it, it all kind of collapses at around 340. Um, it regenerates slowly again into basically an ambient piece um, for the remaining three or so minutes. The track goes for about six minutes, I think. Um, and so it's sort of a, you know, it's an A and then it's a B and the B is completely different to A and that segues into the next track. And finally, track three called Fly. We get something a little bit more conventional, um, not 100% conventional and certainly not the low of old, but um, something we can sort of cling on to a bit more, I suppose. Um, there's a, another further minute-ish of Eno-esque kind of ambient um, pads and filters and finally Mimi Parker's sort of more pure voice um, uh, presents I guess the most tangible melody um, or conventional melody with conventional words on the album so far. Um, structurally it's probably the most conventional thing on the album so far as well. It's a verse and then a chorus and then another verse and then another chorus and a coda. Um, so it's you know it is more conventional in, in all sorts of ways. Um, there's a brilliant kind of almost dub-like bass line which propels the song um, onwards. Um, but there's almost a complete absence of other rhythmic uh, instruments, like the drums are basically non-existent. Um, the last minute of the song sounds like something left from the Kid A sessions or something, Radiohead's Kid A sessions, very sort of chopped up vocal samples, um, it's a bit of piano and distorted kind of groove. Um, it's a beautiful song, Fly. So if, you, if you're if you interested in what I'm saying so far, maybe start with that song, start with the song called Fly and see how that goes for you and then sort of go back to the beginning if, if that's doing it for you. Uh, the fourth track is called Tempest. Um, it's another sort of long-ish introduction. Um, it has distorted chords. It 
sort of the instrument that the chords are played on is kind of unrecognisable. I'm not really sure what the instrument is. It might be a guitar, it might be a synthesizer. Um, the vocals are very affected again with the coders, compression. Um, basically, it means the vocals are another layer in, in, in the um, texture. They're not doing what vocals usually do, which is to articulate words. They're treated as an instrument. Um, it basically sounds like Kraftwerk getting together with um, Kevin Shields from My Bloody Valentine and creating this really beautiful texture and the words themselves don't really matter. Um, it's hypnotic. Um, it's like a lot of this album, it's, it's a solitary listen. It's not meant to be heard, you know, in a social situation. It's, it's not really background music. It's, it's probably a headphone listen and it's, it's a solitary listen. Um, which leads to the next track called Always Up, um, which I mentioned the vocal harmonies of Alan Sparhu and Mimi Palmer before, Mimi Parker before. Um, this is a great example of those gorgeous harmonies in that in the first half or so of, of this track. Um, it becomes pretty sinister during the third verse, I think. Um, a sort of synth pad gradually washes into the mix, um, followed by this watery analog motif, like a synth thing, um, which becomes a bit thinner pretty quickly and it, it sounds very fragile. Um, and an ambient coda finishes this track as well, a lot of ambience on this album. Um, I really love this track, it's, it's really quite beautiful but also very sinister as well. Uh, the next song is called Always Trying to Work It Out. It's another duet, another vocal duet. Um, and I guess a bit like Fly, a little bit more conventionally structured this time. It's, it's a verse, chorus, verse, chorus kind of thing. Um, the sonics, again, are pretty haunted on this one. It's um, interesting vocally. There's a subtle auto-tune thing going on in the last bit of the vocal section, I think, in the final chorus, maybe. Um, and the, the coda section itself is quite distorted and crackly. Um, but then a final chorus again is repeated and gives some relief from all of this um, distorted tension, I suppose. Uh, this is followed by a very ambient, probably the most ambient sort of mood piece of the album called The Sun, The Sun. The S-O-N, comma, the S-U-N. Um, I'm not very poetic today, so I'm not going to try to interpret that. But there's no real words to be heard, as far as I can tell. Um, it's very ambient. It's it's a, almost like a bit of a palate cleanser for the final four tracks um, before they bring home the album, I suppose. Um, it's a beautiful piece of music, um, but it's not really a song, as it were. Um, this leads into Dancing and Fire. Um, and... I guess this most resembles the low of old, this song, if you want to get a sense of what low used to sound like, sort of 15, 20 years ago. Um, Dancing and Fire is probably the closest to that. Um, it's got a gently strung guitar, it's got Alan Sparhawk's sort of very plaintive voice um, introducing the song, um, a lyric which um, reads, it's not the end, it's just the end of hope. Um, from the opening stanza, I think, is, is a pretty good indicator of the mood of the track. Very bleak, um, melancholic again. Um, Mimi Parker's vocals join in pretty quickly as well. Um, it's a wider, more expansive sound than the, than the old Lovo. It's not exactly the same. It's sort of um, subtly, um, uh, subtly affected, I guess, by um, some atmospheric flourishes and synthesizers and effects and things like that um, but yeah most closely resembles old low um, and this leads into a song called poor sucker um, it moves more quickly than the other songs on the album there's almost a total absence of any um, any anything rhythmic apart from the vocals themselves everything else is a bit still and the vo it really makes you focus on on the words themselves um, and a pulse begins to emerge sort of maybe halfway through the song, um, but it's, it's definitely not a dominant pulse. Um, it's, it's almost like a mantra. It's, it's hypnotic. Um, it puts you in this kind of trance. 
Um, I'm not sure what the words are about, but they seem to be about something quite awful and apocalyptic even. Um, I'm not going to try and interpret exactly what it's trying to suggest, but it's clearly um, some kind of evil occurrence as, as, um, um, is, is being described. And this leads into a song called Rome, um, which is kind of appropriate given um, what we know about what happened to Rome and the sort of apocalyptic nature of the previous track. Um, it's a very sort of slow, distorted beat that grounds this track. Um, Alan Sparhawk's voice again is, is a dominant, is the dominant voice in the track, but Mimi Parker sort of subtly supports this in her upper register. Um, it's got a lot of distorted instruments, but um, particularly a guitar, which sounds like it's kind of desperate to break out of this prison, um, kind of keeps stabbing the mix. Um, and this leads into the final track, which is called Disarray. Um, and lyrically, it seems to describe this spirit possession. Um, one of the lyrics is, they say you let it in when you took the drugs. The it being some kind of spirit, I think. Um, it's, yeah, it's another vocal harmony song. They sound absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's a very insistent kind of distorted pulse or compressed pulse um, that drives the song, almost like banging on the door that sort of just refuses to stop. Um, it's a relentless beat. It sounds like, you know, the band is trying to break free of some kind of containment. Um, again, maybe it's that spirit trying to, trying to get out. Um, and that concludes the album. It's, it's a very um, uneasy listen, um, but it's a very impressive listen. It's produced wonderfully. Um, it sort of leaves a bit of a mark on you. Um, it's not easy to you know, get up and resume normal life straight away, which may or may not appeal really. Um, it's definitely not an album for every occasion and every mood, um, but that's actually the case with a lot of great albums. Um, I don't think that's a reason to, to not want to listen to it. Um, you know, it's a challenging album, but that's good. I think we should be challenged as listeners uh, as much as we can tolerate, I suppose. Um, many excellent albums are meant to be heard in solitary comfort, you know, possibly with headphones or without any kind of other social interruption. Um, this is one of them. Um, I mean, the ambient genre itself, like, you know, ambient music kind of exists under these conditions, um, you know, as do other sort of haunting and discomforting albums. You know, I'm thinking here like about artists such as, I guess, Red House Painters or um, Smog, Bill Callahan's old project Smog, and even Early Low themselves, you know, these are these are records which don't um, get played out in public or at parties or in dinner parties, but they are meant to be experienced, um, you know, alone and sort of felt quite deeply. And this is another one of those records. Um, you know, I've, I've read reviews describing this as Lowe's Trump album. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how true that is, but mood wise, it sort of really feels, um, apocalyptic it sort of suggests that the band who are mormons by the way the members of lower mormons it might suggest that they see the present day things going on in sort of spiritually bankrupt terms um a lot of the emotional content feels that way on this album um i made a comparison earlier um in this review to radiohead's kid a and i think a bit like radiohead's kid a um this album will sound sort of paradoxically both relevant and completely out of time um, in in many years. I think it's one of those albums which stands outside of, um, you know, whatever present context and seems to just sort of envelop you um, in its own reality. And that's sort of the hallmark of a great record, I think. Um, you know, you forget the rest of the world and you just experience the, this inner world of what Lowe has created here. And I think for that reason, um, it deserves a really um, high score. I mean, I hate scoring music because it's music. You're not meant to, you know, measure it like you measure someone running 100 metres. But, you know, let's, um, let's do what most music reviewers do. Let's give it a score. I'd give it 
you know, very, very high praise. I would put a nine, nine and a half out of 10. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not the perfect album um, if such a thing exists, but it's, it's right up there in terms of its, um, its artfulness, its intent, and the fact that it manages to achieve and even surpass um, a lot of the, um, I guess, the implied intent of the content. So um, here I am recommending very, very heartily Lowe's new album, Double Negative. If it sounds a little bit suspicious, maybe give it a list, listen on Spotify first. Um, but, you know, don't judge it on the first listen either. I think this one takes a few listens and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, that's it. I will maybe review something next time or maybe talk about something else next time. But thank you so much for watching. I would love to hear what you think about Lowe's Double Negative if, you, if you've listened to it or if you have any particular response to it. Um, please leave me a comment. Um, please hit subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you next time. Bye.